is Lee Greenwood Health Protection Program of the Nature Conservancy. Um, I'm going to be giving a presentation today on uh, public polling research and um, communications directions for the work that I do as the director of the Don't Move Firewood Outreach Campaign. Um, it's going to be a lot of research findings. I've presented some of these findings before and some of them are new in the course of the last about six months since we conducted our most recent survey. My apologies for anybody who rolls their eyes when they see a few of the graphs that I already presented, say, in January and October, but there are new ones as well as there's new information. Um, it's very, very important stuff. I, um, I'm in Canada this week at the National Invasive Species Council meeting for Canadians, and the number one thing that they said is, gosh, how do we evaluate our success in behavior change here in Canada? And, and I raised my hand like, uh, like Hermione Granger in Harry Potter, like, oh, oh, I know the answer, I know the answer. It's, um, you have to do repeated public polling to, a success, to assess whether or not you've been successful in behavior change. There really isn't another good way to do it. And so what I'm going to be doing is presenting on our best public polling processes that we've gone through in the last 11 years and what we've learned and what directions we're going to be taking in light of the public polling. One thing I was actually hoping, because we don't have a terribly large group, which is great, um, is if everybody could put in their name um, they're, the state they're in, just, you know, the two-letter abbreviation is fine, and the agency there or group or professional um, affiliation that they have within the chat box, and I would love to see who is on this talk um, as I go forward, and the chat box, I believe, is on the bottom right for everybody, and just make sure that the, it's set to something like, you know, all participants or all staff or whatever it is it says that's all everybody, so that hopefully I can see it. So if you want to write that, um, while I get started, that would be really helpful for me to understand who is watching this webinar at this time. Uh, we have 20 people, so it won't be too long of a list. All right, let's get started. So the three things that I'm going to be covering today are going to be our survey results, which like I said, we concluded our most recent survey roughly six months ago. Um, actually, a few more months now. Time keeps pushing on. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Don't Move Fire campaign direction in light of these survey findings. So I'm going to take sort of a synopsis of the whole thing at the end and say, like, what am I personally as the campaign director going to be moving forward with? And then I'm going to discuss some take-home messages for us all to consider in all of our work. I really encourage you to please also put questions in the chat box as I go. It's so helpful to know what people need to know or what I'm not explaining very well that informs my future webinars as well as, of course, in the moment what you need to know. Our most recent survey was conducted uh, July and August 2016. We conducted 1,223 phone interviews with American voters. We do both conduct the surveys on landlines and cell phones because the demographics of the owners of those phones are very different. This hugely increases the cost of the survey. These surveys are crazy expensive because the American public is increasingly savvy with phone surveys and avoiding them, quite frankly. And so in order to get a really good um, demographic spread across the United States, you have to have a heck of a lot of attempts before you get one good phone call. We're going to use selective compare that we have conducted in many past years, including 2005 seminal surveys that we base a lot of our longitudinal data on as well as our 2007, 2008, 2010, and, of course, comparing them to today, or last year now, it's 2017. I'd like you to take just a quick moment to please look at this map, maybe write down on a piece of scratch paper next to your computer which region you live in or which region you're most interested in, if those are not necessarily the same thing. I'll be talking, talking about the United States Census Divisions a fair amount, and it helps to know the name. Not all of them are terribly intuitive. For instance, the east-south-central region is kind of goofy. Um, and uh, so yeah, keep an eye on which region you're in, write it down, and it'll inform some of my graphs later. Oops, sorry. So first we're going to start out with some context on attitudes on forest pest issues in general. 
in general, in the United States, um, there are a lot of issues that are far more serious to the public than environmental concerns. When we took this survey in July and August, the cost of health care was the top survey issue of concern. Um, unemployment in the economy was the next biggest. We don't have every issue under the sun in this list, um, and that's okay. We're just trying to get a feel for the public. You can see about midway through this, this slide, you start to get into sort of environmental concepts of pollution. And then below that, you start getting into really straightforward environmental concerns such as habitat. But it takes all the way to the next slide for us to get bumped all the way into issues distinctly affecting our work, forest health. So insects that kill trees and diseases that kill trees um, may are extremely serious uh, from the perspective of the public only to a relative minority of people, so about a quarter of people. Uh, I forgot to mention it a few slides ago, but our margin of error is about 4%-ish. It depends a little bit on the sample and the survey because we have multiple surveys we're looking at. Um, but any difference that's around 4% is right at the margin of whether or not it is statistically significant. And you can say with pretty good certainty that once you're past the 5%, 5%, 6% mark, that is a statistically significant difference between two sample groups. And Rebecca, too, if anybody asks a question that is pertinent to a particular slide and you want to jump in because we have a whole hour, I'm happy to be interrupted if you think it's something that needs to be addressed quickly. All right. Um, in terms of what people actually do, or rather what they say they do, we have a lot of gardeners in the United States, or at least aspiring gardeners, as well as quite a few hikers. Um, and people who like to look at things, um, such as wildlife and birding and so forth, we don't have nearly as many really active users in terms of fishing and hunting as one might suspect. And of course, my interest area lies mostly in firewood, um, and the user groups that use a lot of firewood are some of these lower um, percentage groups, such as fisher, um, fishermen and women and hunters. Um, as well as people who use vacation homes and cabins, which often are heated with firewood. Uh, it will surprise pretty much nobody on this phone that firewood users are more likely than the average Joe to um, participate in an outdoor activity. It's a pretty significant difference in terms um, of all of the different outdoor user groups that we um, surveyed on. Um, you can see that it's particularly prominent uh, in gardening, which I think that may be because that is also the most common activity. I don't know exactly how much that is a one-to-one -one relationship, but more common activity showing more firewood users. One thing that we've looked at from year to year that really informs our approach in terms of trying to affect the way that people um, purchase and use firewood in different ways. Do they actually trust to learn about issues of forest health? It's really critically important that if you have a message that you want to get across, that your messenger is somebody that's being listened to. Otherwise, obviously, you're not getting your message across. In the United States, the most believable people we have on issues of forest health are park rangers. Interestingly, we've done surveys on this and discovered that people believe a park ranger is basically someone in a uniform with a nice hat. So a park ranger does not literally have to be a park ranger. It's just somebody that's kind of like a park ranger. Likewise, um, we might all, a lot of the folks in the state and federal agencies who feel sometimes vilified or at least disrespected by the public in terms of whether or not they're being listened to, that is a minority of people who don't like um, interacting with Forest Service and forestry type professionals. Actually, the vast majority really think that they are well-trusted professionals, and that's what we see um, in our current political climate of a lot of loud voices, shall we say. It's hard to remember that the majority of people um, who have sort of a neutral or positive opinion on something are quiet. It is often the negative voices that become loudest. I work for the Nature Conservancy. That is the third to the bottom list in um, item. Uh, 
because that is a specific name of a conservation organization, but you can profit that is considered a conservation organization, something like a land trust or a different um, organization besides the Nature Conservancy, you also have a very high level of trust. So it's 74% um, it's of people think you're really believable, which is pretty impressive. So let's get into some forest pest and pathogen data, more specifically on the different um, insects and diseases of concern. So this sample of the entire United States and um, whether or not people say they're familiar with the idea of forest pests and pathogen is pretty interesting to me. You can see, oh, I've got a mislabel on the slide. I'm sorry. Please ignore the part where it says the highest point in 2007. I, I must have copied and pasted that from the wrong spot. Um, the highest point on this slide is actually 2010, but it's not a statistically significant um, measure over time between 2005, 2010, and 2016. So essentially, people are more or less equally familiar with forest pests for the last 11 years, which is sort of amazing. Um, a lot of things come and go in the, in the mindset of the public. Um, but forest pests has had roughly equal awareness levels with the concepts of them. Um, Interestingly, we have had a pretty significant jump in the number of people that say they've heard a lot of five and 10 and 16. So 10 and 16, are, uh, that's the dark green on the far left, and those categories have had a pretty good sized jump. My personal opinion is that all of the large urban areas that have been affected with emerald ash borer are probably the driver of this distance, of this difference, but that heard a lot versus heard a little or cumulatively heard hasn't changed a great deal. It's a little weird to not have any people jumping in and asking me questions. Rebecca, are you still there? You're probably on mute. Yes, I am still here. No, um, every, several people did uh, in their chat box put in where they were from and, and who they were and and in some cases, you know, their their position, but you don't you don't have any direct questions at the moment. Okay, it's I just normally I'm always hearing people being like, "Well, Lee, tell me about question <laughs> column four. So I wanted to make sure everyone's awake. Yeah, um, every, everyone's okay. awake. Okay, <laughs> thanks everybody. Um, it it just feels a little bit talking into the void, but that's fine. I'll I'll deal with it. Okay. So in terms of forest pest familiarity, we're going to see some of the changes in, in um, awareness of, and name recognition of pests in these graphs. Um, the years, or most recent that we have available at a national level for forest pests and pathogens, we don't have this data for every time sector, for every pathogen, for national areas, but we do have it for some key ones. You can see that some of those key pests are ones that have been around for a long time. The awareness levels are not changing a huge amount, but sometimes we do see variation. So for instance, Dutch elm disease basically has not changed over time. Um, gypsy moth, there is a slight dive in 2016, uh, but I would imagine if we did it in 2017 because of the, some of the large outbreaks that we did see during the course of 2016, that number might pop back up. But we won't be able to do a survey on that in 2017, so that data may, no long, may not get captured. Um, chestnut blight is holding even. Laurel wilt, which is um, a pest of only um, regional concern and lower awareness uh, is maintaining pretty low numbers over time, even though its spread has been extremely dramatic between 2010 and the bar above it, um, which is accidentally not properly labeled, and that's the 2016 bar, with the 91% of people say they have not heard of that pest. However, we do see some noticeable changes according to region and time in some pests, and this is kind of a crazy slide, but if you'll note, I've divided out those census regions that I told you earlier, you should write down which one you're in, and you can see how things are going up and down in terms of different areas and different um, times. So in the east, north, central region of the United States, where awareness was very high during um, 2010 in terms of the Asian longhorn beetle, almost certainly because of the effective outreach 
um, done in the Illinois Chicago area, um, that awareness has actually gone down because, for one thing, that pest um, is in now in an eradication program success story, and so there is no longer so much in the news about it. Whereas in New England, the drop has been a lot less um, distinct over time. Again, New England is an area that has an Asian longhorn beetle infestation, specifically in Worcester, Massachusetts, as well as the infestation that was just the small spot infestation that was discovered in Boston. In the northeastern area as a whole, there's been um, significant decreases in the number of people that have heard a lot about Asian longhorn beetle, but um, not quite, well actually, excuse me, about equally uh, large numbers of people have either heard yes or no versions. So there's only very small drops in people who have gone from saying that they've heard something about Asian longhorn beetle to um, between years and 16. Um, and that northeastern area is a much bigger region than New England, which is probably why you're seeing a more muted effect. Um, we only have data on Asian longhorn beetle awareness um, specifically in 2005 for particular states that we um, surveyed at that time. Uh, that was simply the only places that we had the ability to survey at that time, and those were the only places that had Asian longhorn beetle at that time. And so that's our baseline data for affected places in 2005. And you can see that that awareness was actually quite high. It's comparable with some of the other high awareness areas in 2010, um, such as New England and, um, to a greater extent, the East North Central Census region. So if you do outreach, if you have a pest, if you're pushing that information out to the public, we can see that you can create a significant amount of um, name awareness of a pest, but it dies away as the problem goes away. People forget about the pest. They say that they've never heard of it, or they say that they've heard a little bit of it, and there's a lot fewer people that have heard a lot about it. And so the longer you get away from the media storm of a big pest sort of splash, an eradication effort, or a tree cutting, or a um, asking the public to look for something, the farther away you get from those moments, the less people out. We also are seeing this now with the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is, as we all know, spreading across its current infested areas quite rapidly and um, we're reaching sort of peak awareness levels in the deeply affected areas. So in the east north central census region, um, we don't have a perfect comparative sample between 2005 and 10 and 16, but it's very similar. I believe it's only missing one state. Um, so we had emerald ash borer in that region in 2005, that's the lowest bar, and then we've had a sustained and high level of awareness in 2010, 2016. I would expect if we have the ability to do this survey again, um, say in another three to five years, we will see another sustained high bar because of the deep um, and very significant effects that are going to continue to happen on emerald ash borer. And then at some point, when that pest has killed all the ash trees in that region, and it's no longer the, something that shows up in municipal budgets and nightly news and um, lots of other media outlets and uh, outreach campaigns, that high level of awareness is going to start to die. Now in the southern United States, in the south region of the census regions, we are seeing the rise of awareness. You know, that emerald ash borer is starting to come into both urban and rural areas in the southern region, and so that, that awareness is creeping up. It hasn't quite reached the point that we were in in the affected areas in 2005 yet, but it's going to get there eventually with sustained outreach. So these things change greatly according to region, through time, and through where they are in an infestation. Nationally, concern about forest pests as a whole peaked in 2010 and is now about comparable to 11 years ago when we started surveying. Uh, this is an interesting result because it's not entirely clear what's driving the decrease. Um, I would personally guess it's a uh, lack of interest in some urban areas in emerald ash borer, the fact that some people are sort of like over it. Um, 
but that is entirely a guess, and it totally remains to be seen if this is simply a, nat a natural fluctuation in um, concern. So for instance, if we were able to take this survey again in 2020, perhaps it would be another natural fluctuation upwards, and so then we would be able to say that, hey, now we're comparable um, to the 2010 results. There's no way to really know. Interestingly, the people that say that they're really concerned about forest pests really varies according to age, with the highest level of extremely concerned people being um, in the older age ranges, and the levels of less concerned or not concerned people um, being a little bit more variable. Also, I find it really fascinating that big city residents are more concerned than medium city, suburban area, and small town residents but actually extremely similar to those in rural areas. And this really speaks to the need to use surveys in order to understand your audience of who cares about your problem. Um, if you know this, you are able to more effectively figure out where you need to take action to either drive up concern, if that's what you need, or at least talk to only people who are concerned, if that's what you need. And it turns out that with forest pests, there's somewhat of an unpredictable um, spread on, in, that cons in that regard. Now, in terms of the census region itself, there is variation in um, concern as well. I think that um, you know the, the variation there is a little bit harder to interpret, um, but might uh, be reflective of historical pest and pathogen infestation patterns. So the Northeast um, and the Midwest being sort of generally higher than the South and West. Um, also really important is that the public often does not understand the difference between native pests and non-native pests. So some of the data in the west and actually also the south might be driven by mountain pine beetle for the west and uh, southern pine beetle and other pests in the south. It's hard to say um, exactly where that's coming from. Right, let's get into the meat of the matter, which is firewood. Uh, we know that firewood that Use varies by place and purpose of the fire itself. More people use it um, than is represented here because there's a tremendous overlap in the usage. So it's about 50% of people use, um, oh sorry, it's, there's tremendous overlap in the usage of, of firewood. Um, <laughs> I'm misphrasing this. And so some of these categories don't add up exactly because some people use it both at home and um, not at home, so when they're traveling. Also, please note that the categories don't line up. Um, the burn at home category of 11 or more is not the same as the burn not at home for 10 or more times. That's because of historical survey methods that we've been keeping consistent um, over time. So you can see a lot of people say they never use firewood. 47% um, and um, my mouse actually isn't showing what 50-ish percent the burn not at home saying they never use firewood. And it's really important to realize that there is no need to reach out with a don't move firewood, buy it where you burn it type outreach message to all of those people that never use firewood. There's no need to waste our breath on those people. We don't need to waste our outreach dollars on them. And part of what we've been doing is trying to make sure that we actually reach the other 50% of people and not wasting our time on people that never use firewood. In fact, a lot fewer people are now saying they never move firewood than they used to say. So basically they're saying, I use firewood, but I don't move it and move it um, from location to location. And we don't have complete survey data on because of our 2007 data techniques, um, which I cannot go back in time and change and get more money to do a full national survey. But if you look at the green bar in the never category, the dark green, is an identical survey uh, region to the light green, and you can see a huge jump in the people who say they never move firewood. Um, you can also compare the highly affected regions of 2007, which is the dark green bar, to the entire nation of 2016, not all of which is highly affected by uh, non-native forest pests, and you can see that even when you do this sort of poor comparison of two regions that are different, you still see a really big improvement. So some areas with 
low experience with forest pests are already doing better than we were in 2007 in areas that were hard hit by forest pests. This is a, a net improvement. And I think if you take one thing away from this presentation um, that I'm giving today, I want you to see that the amount of firewood that is being moved is decreasing in the United States in a demonstrable, statistically significant way. Um, and that's huge. You know, we are reducing the movement of firewood. This behavior is decreasing. It's an incremental change. We're never going to be able to do it overnight. Um, Smokey Bear did not change human behavior overnight. Keep America Beautiful did not prevent people from littering overnight. Buy it where you burn it as a slogan and don't move firewood as a campaign are not going to stop people from moving firewood overnight. But we're going to keep getting that bar lower and lower and lower, or in the case of the never move firewood, getting that bar higher and higher and higher so that we can get this change ingrained into the North American public so that we have fewer people moving firewood um, for any reason. Additionally, when people do say, yeah, I kind of move firewood, now they're saying they're moving it less far. So even if they're sort of only half obeying, they're half obeying better. And that's great because these problems are exacerbated by long distance movement and extreme long distance movement especially is very worrisome um, because we don't have a lot of good coping mechanisms to prevent those through um, regulation and um, interdiction or any kind of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, compliance operations. So the shorter distances tend to be less damaging as well as more controllable. And we're seeing more people when they move firewood, which is not what we want them to do. But when they do, they're not moving it quite as far. So that's a good thing. Graph because it's maddening and you kind of can't tell what's going on in it. So let's go through this one. Um, um, just sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, Hans I did have a question. I'm not sure exactly which graph he's referencing, he says the y-axis has no label. Is this percentage? Are those numbers percentages? Oh, these numbers are all percentages for a given color out of 100. And they don't always add up to 100 perfectly because there's a lot of rounding errors in our statistics and the way they get displayed when I convert them from the statistical package to Excel to PowerPoint. Okay. So we might add up to 102. But so for instance, in this one, um, like all the dark greens are going to be percentages, and all the dark greens should add up to 100 or at least close to 100. OK. He, he said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. That's a great question. I'm sorry it's not labeled. It should be. Or maybe I should have said it out loud earlier. Um, so when you ask people, uh, if you move firewood, how far do you move it? Um, you can see when you match up the samples uh, from the similar regions, which is the green to green, um, the number of people who are moving it on the left-hand side, 2007, 65% said they were moving it 50 miles or less, and 2016, 80%. And of course, 50 miles is the metric that we supplied the public with for a very long time as the sort of OK distance to move firewood. As flawed as that may be, that is what they have internalized for the large part. and so. Um, there's been a jump of 15% of people say, yes, I'm adhering to that rule of thumb that you have provided us. Um, because we do not have a national sample from 2007, I can't really say exactly what's going on there, but I do want to show that when you go from 2007, that 65% in the highly affected area, and then you look into 2016, the whole nation is now statistically identical to where, where the northeastern area and the upper Midwest were fully 11 years ago. Or sorry, that's nine years ago. Um, so a highly affected area's behavior is now the behavior of the whole nation. So that's the change that you can see there. Generally speaking, where we have national data, it shows that about two in five people have heard that she, they shouldn't move firewood in some sort of fashion. And this is the question that we ask them 
at the top of the slide. Have you ever seen, heard, or read any information urging the public not to move firewood from place to place? Really consistent from 2010 to 2016, um, as well as our smaller sample size that was in 2007. Those are not changed. Um, I'm pleased to see this because, as you may have noticed from other slides, there has been variation in concern. There's been variation in pest awareness. But the number of people saying, oh, no, I know I'm not supposed to move firewood is holding steady. Now, you would think that I would really want this to be a number that's going upwards. And I do. I think that it would be great if we had shown a spike in people saying, I've heard that we shouldn't move firewood. But the reality is that there's over 300 million people in the United States. And for us to hold their attention effectively for six years, from 2010 to 2016, and have them keep saying, no, we understand this, that unto itself is an achievement. And in fact, if we continue doing this, we should see the numbers going up even though we haven't seen it statistically going up yet. Regional improvement can be seen over time. Um, I picked out some uh, data that combines into the region from 2007 to show you um, so that you can see the differences. So in 2007, all three regions were surveyed. And I don't have the ability to parse apart the data here, which is why I'm showing it as it is shown. Um, with 36% of people saying they had heard not to move firewood in 38, excuse me, 38% of people, it's the dark brown bar saying that they had heard not to move firewood in 2007. Now when you break apart those regions um, in the 2016 data, you can see that we have seen improvements in two out of the three different parts that contributed to that data. So 70% of people now in the east, north, central region of the United States have said, we know that you're not supposed to move firewood. And that's outstanding. Obviously, New England is um, really, it's, it's, it's pretty close to being an honor student there. It's about 50-50 there, which is uh, um, reflective of the very hard work that they've been doing, both on Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer, um, and certainly other um, non-pest specific campaigns in that area. I'm just reminding you of your census division because I'm about to show you another graph of all of them. Remember? OK. There's a tremendous amount of regional variation beyond what I just showed in two, gra two slides ago of who's heard this message. Um, you can see that the worst awareness right now belongs to the region I live in, which is the mountain region. We only have 11% of people that say they've heard not to move firewood. And the best awareness right now is in the east, north, central, with 70% of people saying they know that they shouldn't be moving firewood. So we've got a long ways to go in some of the less affected areas, um, but we're doing extremely well in some of the most heavily affected areas by forest pests that are vectored on firewood, that have state agencies, partners, nonprofits, et cetera, telling people this is not a desirable behavior, and it is being internalized, and they know that this is not a behavior they should be doing. Um, this is a very important point. When you say that you've heard not to move firewood. And then we ask you, so are you not moving firewood? Um, oh, indeed, I'm not. You told me not to, and I'm not doing it, which is good, because you could actually say the opposite thing. You could say, you told me not to move firewood, but I'm moving it anyway because I don't believe you. We don't see that too badly. We see that actually people who claim that they've heard it are less likely to say, that they are, are more likely to say that they actually don't move firewood. So that's good. It means that they're actually um, internalizing the message. Interestingly, um, the people that are most likely to have heard the message are in the um, older, although not oldest, of our surveyed demographics. So these are people that are taking in the message at the highest rate. We're reaching them the best, which is good because a lot of them we know from data that I, I'm not actually going to present right now because I can't present everything I know, um, are firewood moving demographics. Um, so <laughs> this is actually a really repetitive slide. I should probably pull it. I'm just going to skip it. There you go. Um, so in terms of stated awareness of the firewood laws or regulations, and please keep in mind that not every state and area and region has a firewood law or even has a regulation of any type. 
um, stated awareness of them varies greatly across uh, the United States, and I picked a couple for us to look at in terms of different demographics and regions. So, for instance, the Northeastern Census region has a much lower stated awareness of laws or regulations than the Midwest region, which is interesting primarily because there actually are some laws in the Northeast Census region. Um, I didn't even bother putting in the information on the same question for, for instance, the Western region um, or Pacific because there are many fewer laws, so it wouldn't be a very good comparison. You'd basically be asking how many people are making it up, um, and I don't really want to know that. Um, interestingly, too, the lowest level of awareness is in suburban areas, and smaller and mid-sized cities seem to have greater awareness of laws and regulations. And um, we do see some interesting differences in demographic groups by gender and age, and these are the two highest um, and lowest points um, when you compare across gender and age, and that is the men ages 50 plus have a much more high aware than women of the younger um, spectrum 18, years 18 to 49 years old. So um, we are not reaching people equally as a broad brush. We have differences in demographics um, that are important to take into account with our outreach environment. Oops. Okay. Um, so when presenting information to all of these different groups, what we have asked people is, where are you going to believe the information and um, pay attention to it and really information that you receive. And overwhelmingly, we see that people really want to have the information given to them in a relevant location. So those first three items on this list are very relevant to, to the moment of firewood in their life. So when you're going into a state park to go camping, that moment is relevant because you have either have firewood or you don't have firewood, but you're certainly thinking about firewood, and so you want that brochure to have the information presented to you. Um, when you're making a campsite reservation, number two, that is a relevant moment because you're planning to go camping. Number three, when you're buying firewood or thinking about buying firewood for buying things associated with campfires, a poster is going to be somewhere where you think, I really believe I would pay attention in that firewood moment of purchase. Now, we can't always penetrate into these outreach environments. It's maybe not possible to cover the printing costs for providing brochures at the level that would be required to reach all, attend, um, all visitors at a state park. Maybe that's not feasible. But maybe you can hit that second target if you're an outreach specialist. An email has no printing cost. Um, maybe that's something that you can uh, engage in, even if a brochure is not feasible. And so we go down the list of these according to whether or not, number one, you can pay attention to, number two, whether or not you can accomplish it at all. Now, um, immediately, I would imagine a lot of people on this webinar are going to say, well, uh, what about social media? Well, um, it depends a lot on who you are, and the best way to describe the difference is to compare a news article in your local newspaper versus a Facebook post. Now, a Facebook post, obviously, being social media, it actually has one of the lowest ranks I'm definitely pay attention to, but if we were to break out our age demographic groups, we would see some really interesting things in that the younger people surveyed say that Facebook posts are definitely something they would be paying attention to um, far more than older people, depending on exactly how you parse out the ages. But then, for instance, it looks like you could reach a lot of people with a news article. It's 41% of people say they definitely pay attention, and 30% say they would maybe pay attention, which is pretty good. But if you look at that particular one, young people do not say they will pay attention to a news article. So you have to essentially cross over your data. You have to say, okay, if I want to reach this age of people because they are the ones that have not been getting the message and they do use firewood, then I have to look at all of my different methods that they could pay attention to and find the one that that age group actually pays attention to. And then also whether or not it's feasible. So this data can be used in that manner, and I do encourage anybody who's planning an outreach campaign or anything else um, with regards to firewoods to consider whether or not they have 
the knowledge that will allow them to go through these lists and you can just email me and I'll send you some of the information that you'd need to make these choices like if you knew that you were going to be trying to get a hold of lots of retirees because your area receives a lot of retirees and they're going to be moving firewood then by all means put news articles in the local newspaper but if you know that it's actually millennials or um, college students then Facebook posts dis despite being the very last item on this list is a really good approach for you. Um, for years we've been dealing with a question that a lot of communication professionals um, are bantying about right now which is are messages that start with a negative tone less palatable to the public? There's a huge difference between what communications professionals think and what forestry and scientific professionals think and what the public thinks. And in order to display that, one of the things I did accidentally um, <laughs> this past year was split the vote. Um, I should have learned from some political things that have been going on lately that you can't do that. But I asked, which do you think is most effective? And I asked forest health professionals and scientists. I did not ask communication specialists. And I did not ask the general public this. And they said, don't move firewood is the most effective slogan. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really good. And then I looked at buy it where you burn it and buy local, burn local, which is not used very commonly. Um, it's a less standardized slogan. They use it primarily in a few areas of Canada as well as Vermont. Um, and then I added those two percentages together and they exceeded 46% with don't move firewood. And I realized, oh, no. Is buy local, burn local the Bernie Sanders of my sampling approach? And so then when we surveyed the public, not professionals, but the public, we did A-B testing to determine once and for all, what does the public think about these slogans? And absolutely, the public believes what communication specialists have been saying for a long time, which is that positively oriented, action oriented um, slogans within a strict two-party system uh, are more um, effective as a slogan. So there's no statistical difference between buy it where you burn it and buy local, burn local, just incidentally. Sometimes people get confused about that, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we didn't test them against each other in this format because it wouldn't have made sense statistically. But what does matter is that the one that's used in nearly every U.S. state and a very significant part of Canada, which is buy it where you burn it, is considered by the public to be far more effective than the name of our campaign, Don't Move Firewood. And we need to use this, um, put this information out to all of our partners, determine whether or not they feel they can use Buy It Where You Burn It as their front and center slogan, and make sure that this more effective slogan reaches as many people and is as codified in our outreach environment as possible because we've answered the question. Um, it's, it's been on everybody's minds for a long time and now we know the public likes buy it where you burn it better. However, I'm going to put out a big caveat here, which is the public also sometimes thinks that buy it where you burn it is alienating. They want to be able to gather firewood. They may live in a place where buying firewood is entirely either impossible or nearly impossible, such as some of the big open spaces of the, of the West where there literally is no store and there sure are a lot of dead trees. So it's also important to make sure that your outreach message is carefully tailored to your area and if you live in an area or if you're conducting outreach in an area where buying firewood is entirely unreasonable to tell people to do, then you should not be using that slogan. And we'll get back to this little idea in just a minute here. So. I just kind of covered some of this. Um, but I wanted to tell you what I'm going to be doing as the director of the Don't Move Firewood program in the future. We're going to be using the Buy It Where You Burn It slogan wherever we feel it's applicable um, to your area, your situation, and our work. Um, sometimes it's impractical. Like I said, sometimes certified heat-treated firewood is required, and so just saying buy it isn't quite sufficient. Or sometimes gathering firewood is either more logical or necessary, in which case we will be um, using Don't Move Firewood as the dominant slogan and following up with the positive actions that are applicable to the area. We're also going to be using all of this outreach to improve outreach in places, um, making sure that people are finding our outreach at the moment where they're going to listen and then also increasing our focus on trusted messengers. So like I was talking about earlier with park rangers being very well trusted and conservation organizations also being very well trusted, um, we're going to make sure that those uh, messengers are giving out the correct messages 
and also just being utilized in general in our outreach environment. Additionally, um, here in my week in Canada, I've been really impressed um, with how much uh, the interagency and multi-stakeholder stakeholder outreach is important. Um, they don't do it more than in the United States. And for anybody who I maybe didn't tell you, I, I'm spending the week in Canada at their National Invasive Species Council Forum, um, learning about the firewood issues here. and. Uh, sort of ironic considering it's National Invasive Species Week in the United States, but this is where we are. Um, so you cannot take this sort of cooperation for granted, and that's one of the things I've been taking away from my time here. It is incredible how much effort goes into cooperation and how much sometimes we think that this is, this is either easy or simple. It's absolutely not. The different players, the different mandates, the different regulations that we have, they all contribute greatly to our successes and making sure that we're talking to each other is really important. Um, you know, sometimes I get a lot of pushback on, for instance, saying buy it where you burn it, where gathering is feasible, having partners that trust us to do the best possible measuring, um, excuse me, the best possible messaging uh, is incredibly important. That trust is critical. So the other thing too is that a lot of people say, well, like, well, we can't stop the movement of firewood, so why are we even trying? And, that's something that I think um, is self-defeating. Outreach is incremental. You know, you don't not wash your hands because you think you're going to get the flu every winter. Of course you try to prevent it, even though every once in a while you fail. Um, when we look at the details of the statistics, we do see that it is changing its behavior. The public is changing its behavior. They're moving firewood less often, and when they do move firewood, they're moving it shorter distances on the whole. These are incredibly important incremental changes that we are seeing. And when we look at regional changes, those increments get to be physically larger on the graph. You know, that how often it's moved is bigger in regions that are deeply effective that have more um, long-term outreach campaigns present in them. So where are we going to go from here? Well, we're hoping to take um, the steps necessary to continue having this positive messaging, the buy it where you burn it, it's action oriented and those actions can be tailored um, to different regions, but we want to try to stay as consistent as is feasible given the different needs of different environments throughout the United States as well as Canada. Um, one of the great things about working for the Nature Conservancy is that we have a mandate to be collaborative with lots of different organizations. That's part of you know, my job description, is to make sure that I work with lots of other organizations. Um, and we take that very, very seriously as a responsibility in the nonprofit sector to work with all federal partners and state partners that are feasible. And because we're a nonprofit, we have a tremendous flexibility in our approach. So we don't have to say no just because um, somebody is a for-profit institution necessarily depending on the action, whereas a federal government may or may, federal government employee may or may not be able to engage with a for-profit institution in certain topics. We have that latitude and we use it to advance firewood awareness and to slow the spread of invasive species as a whole throughout North America. And that's why you should work with us if you don't already, but I suspect that all 26 of you already do work with us. So, um, you know, I've explained myself a lot in Canada this week, and I wanted to kind of sum it up because um, I realized that I've been taking a little bit for granted how, that people understand how the Don't Move Firewood campaign works. It's nothing like having people give you a blank stare to remind you that you're using too much jargon. So the Don't Move Firewood campaign runs on a important uh, concept of adaptability. We don't have to always say the same thing. Everybody has different pests. We have different norms. The norms of firewood use in Wyoming are dramatically different from the norms of firewood use in Maine, and certainly dramatically different from those in Florida. Um, the beauty of having a single unique um, organization like the Nature Conservancy to sort of serve as the center point to brokers and manage all these different interests and come out on the other side and say, let's, let's stick to the same very core messages of slowing the spread of invasive species without getting so muddled in the details of which bug is going to go on the front of the poster. Um, 
that we can all work together and have a unified outreach environment with a unified outreach um, program we will slow the spread of firewood ex born pests over time that it's the only way to do it if everybody has a different campaign and a different look and a different feel we will be so fractured we will not be effective and I wanted to say too that the the work that we do because it has a history of flexibility and adaptability is going to be responsive to the changing natural national landscape of pests and regulations. We are going to see the eventual deregulation of two major firewood borne pests in concept. Um, you know, emerald ash borne pine shoot beetle will not be regulated forever. This is what I have heard. I believe the National Plant Board is also having major discussions about this concept. Um, just because we don't have necessarily a future emerald ash borer quarantine line does not mean the importance of not moving firewood goes down. If anything, the campaign of behavior change as opposed to regulation compliance becomes even more important. Likewise, we have North America in a dramatic way and we have non-historical ranges of forest pests that are essentially going to operate into the invasive sphere. The two that come to mind very easily with this regard are the southern pine beetle and mountain pine beetle. The last thing we need to do is move a contaminated firewood and hasten the movement of um, these pests into new regions that they are becoming climatically suitable to. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everybody that I work with. Um, we can't do this without the trust and collaboration of dozens state, federal agencies, tribal authorities, nonprofits, and industry members. Um, it's such a collaborative project and um, being here in Canada for the week, it's been really striking to me how um, different uh, the Don't Move Firewood campaign is from a lot of the materials and campaigns that they are familiar with. And it's really struck me how incredibly collaborative and lucky we are to have the ability to have this sort of thing in the U.S. and we're hoping to expand it into Canada um, with much greater levels of involvement than we've had in the past. I also wanted to extend special thanks to USDA APHIS because they've been our predominant funding agency for the last five years. There should be an S on that, sorry. Um, and we can't do this without uh, appropriate and uh, regular funding and it's very much appreciated. If you'd like to email me, especially if you need any particular breakouts of any um, charts, graphs, data, anything, I'm happy to share those with you. My email is right there. That's tnc.org. And also, we recently relaunched our website, and it's a lot more mobile friendly as, long, as well as just being a little more organized and cleaned up. Um, we've reached the modern age of websites, and we're proud to be there. So if you want to check it out after this is over, um, I highly encourage. It's the same URL. We just um, modified the look and feel and function of it. Um, Oh man, I've got eight minutes, or close to it, such good timing. Uh, Rebecca, if you'd like to serve me up some questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, Hans Landell, uh, when you were talking about the different slogans you were, you were mm -hmm. uh, surveying people about, it mentioned, buy it where you burn it only makes sense if the message is about firewood. By itself, uh, it has no message about firewood. So that, yes. I thought that was a pretty... Uh, good point there that if you if you're not me mentioning firewood, people may not understand what the slogan is in and of itself. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that we tackle with good imagery. Buy it where you burn it also does not include pests. Neither does don't move firewood. So we try to um, bring in the whole sort of outreach picture with better use of picture with literal use of pictures. <laughs> Um, in order to tackle that issue. No slogan is perfect. The, one of the best examples is Keep America Beautiful has absolutely nothing to do with litter when you look at each word independently. Um, you know, only you can prevent forest fires does not tell you what the heck it really means. How do I prevent forest fires? Well, of course, the most effective way to prevent forest fires would be go back in time and not have the um, full exclusion of fires in our landscape. But that's not at all what the slogan's about. So, um, we deal with that very real problem with all outreach slogans by trying to have a complete outreach environment that includes um, consistent imagery that calls up the reality of buy it where you burn it using 
um, logs and flames in the poster and in the brochure and so forth. All right, he, uh, he commented that was a great answer and very helpful. Oh, so, thank you. So does anybody else have any questions about anything um, she's talked about so far or anything else you think she might be knowledgeable about? So while they're, uh, while they're coming up with their questions, I just wanted to let you know we have individuals from a good broad swath of, of the U.S. We've got um, Shelly DeFranco's from Michigan, Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. She enjoyed your Harry Potter reference at the beginning. Um, <laughs> Caitlin Stewart, um, Annie Simpson from USGS in Virginia, Thomas, Thomas Lee. Uh, Hans, he just asked a question, what was the sample size for the surveys? Uh, most of the surveys exceed a thousand samples, but they vary by year and region. The um, 2016 was 1,200 plus-ish people. Okay. There's, and I, uh, one thing I want to say too, because um, it's almost impossible to overstate these surveys are crazy expensive to accomplish, and um, I often get pushback from um, biological scientists on the size of our sample. Uh, they say, like, oh, you don't have enough samples. Um, it's so difficult to find appropriate funding to, to get the sample higher than what we've gotten in the past, uh, and um, social scientists generally understand that, and it's getting so much worse with cell phones because it's very difficult to legally procure cell phone numbers that you can call with this sort of information and obviously we would never do a survey in a fashion that was not legal um, unlike some phone calls that you probably receive. So that's why it's so hard to keep our sample size high enough to drive down our error rates. Okay, um, Kristen Comely, uh mentioned, I think a lot of people who want to follow firewood guidelines get confused about what is, quote, local. As mm -hmm. you said, it may not be available to buy locally. How do you address this? That is one of the trickiest questions that we have in the environment of firewood outreach. Um, you know, we try to address it by tailoring the outreach to the region. If there's heat-treated firewood, we mention, um, you know, firewood from uh, excuse me, as local as possible or with heat treatment. If there isn't heat treated firewood, we, add, we follow the guidelines of the particular state or region, which might be within 50 miles, um, which is like a New York, uh, well, a lot of states use it. New York is the best example. Uh, Wisconsin uses a 25 mile rule of thumb. I would urge you to look at our map on our website because each state has its own entry that includes what the formal recommendation is for the state. Uh, I happen to live in the state of Montana, and their recommendation is, quote, as close as possible from within the state of Montana, and that's all we got. We're kind of a big state, so, uh, you know, that's what we do. Um, there is no right or wrong answer to that question, in my opinion. Um, the biologically and scientifically proven answer, as I understand it from some research that has been done, suggests that the real true answer is 10 miles. That completely ignores the reality of our um, modern lives, and I don't mean that as a, a problem in the research. The research is true. However, telling people in an effective outreach environment that they should always get firewood from within 10 miles of where they're going to burn it is entirely unrealistic, and um, that is just a reality. And so we do not suggest the 10 miles as what we tell people to do because it wouldn't happen. We would alienate everybody. All right, uh, Annie Simpson from USGS said, Lee always gives a great talk that is based on good data. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. So any other questions? I mean, we've got people from New Hampshire, Delaware, D.C., uh, state parks and National Park Service. Hans Landell from, is from uh, Texas, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So you have a good good cross-section of people here. Anybody else have any other questions while we have the opportunity?
Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for being a great moderator for the call, too. I wanted to make sure I got that out there before everybody hangs up. Um, and please do go to our website. We did redo the whole thing. I'm really interested in any uh, constructive criticism of its navigation or anything else that you notice that you used to really value in our old website that perhaps you either cannot find or is truly not no longer there. Um, I don't want to lose any important resources, and uh, it was an enormous website to move over to a new platform. We did our very, very best, but uh, I admit I could have made mistakes. So please take a moment once you hang up the phone to go to just don'tmovefirewood.org, same website as always, and poke around and make sure that you can find what you want, and email me if you can't. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any more questions here, so uh, Hans Landell said the website looks great. <laughs> Thanks, Hans. And he just looked at it. Um, cool. So I think that will be it for now. Well, so. thank you. All Have right. a great afternoon, everybody. And uh, be sure, guys, we have one more talk tomorrow um, at 11 p.m. Uh, sorry, 11 a.m. Eastern. So be sure to stop by and uh, listen in on that, ask any questions, and I hope to see as many of you tomorrow as possible. Have a good one.